I keep hoping someday soon it'll be possible to bring the kids back down front as we used to do. But if, you'll, if the adults will allow me just a quick moment. For the kids, it is always good to give thanks. I start lots of my prayers that way. We always want to, want to start by giving thanks. I found out that today is Johnny Appleseed Day. And, and for the kids, you probably don't know who that is. You should ask your parents. And if they don't know, go look it up. You can find a wonderful little article in Wikipedia. The reason I bring this up, um, years ago, Disney did a little cartoon about Johnny Appleseed. And it's got the greatest little song in it about giving thanks. And so since the homily isn't so much interesting to you, this is your homily. It goes like this. The Lord is good to me, and so I thank the Lord for giving me the things I need, the sun and the rain and the apple seed. The Lord is good to me. You should look that up. You can find it on YouTube. Oh, thanks. You should find that on YouTube. Learn that song. It's a great little tune, and you could just whistle that one. Remind yourself that God is good. But for the adults, the, the question, are the arrows pointing in or are the arrows pointing out? That was the question that was given to me, asked me, by a very wise spiritual guy some years ago. He wanted to know if my life was oriented inward, meaning that everything was about me. I was interested in accumulating a lot of stuff. I was interested in accumulating popularity, prestige, power, whatever it was. It was all about me. The arrows were focused in. Or was it about others? Were the arrows focused out? Was I living a life of service? Did I care more about serving others than I cared about myself? It's a terrific question. I might add, it's a good question to ask of groups and parishes might ask it of us. Are the arrows around here? Are they focused inward? Do we do everything about our, you know, for ourselves, or are we focused outward? These gospel stories uh, provide a really good example of two people that had their the arrows pointed out. Moses and Jesus both have similar situations. They're both in a position where they could have said, oh no, this is all about me. And Moses could have said, for example, no, I don't want anyone else to prophesy. I certainly don't want people to prophesy in the camp when they weren't given permission. You know, because it's all about Moses, he could have said. But he doesn't do that. He says to Joshua, you don't have to be jealous because of me. I like this. I want these guys to prophesy. I wish, indeed, the whole camp had the Spirit of God on them. The arrows were pointed out. Jesus, same way, you know, the disciples, you know, I love this picture. They come to him, you know, like, we saw this person over there. He's, he's, he's doing ministry in your name, but he hasn't filled out our registration papers. He can't do this. And, and Jesus is like, it's, it's fine. It's fine. Let him. Let him. We need all the help we can get. It's fine. It's not about our little circle. It's about ministry. So you know that this is our third week, I hope you know, our third and final week of our stewardship campaign, time and talent stewardship campaign. And we've been looking at this idea that um, everything we have comes from God. And, um, and, our, and the question is, what's our responsibility to it? So this idea of the arrows, if you will, is a great way to look at that issue again. Is you just say, well, stewardship, you know, if I'm not being a good, a good steward, the arrows are probably pointing inward because I only care about myself. I'm just interested in me, you know, what's in it for me. But if I live a life of stewardship and I'm at willing to ask those questions, what's the best use of my time? What's the best use of my talent and money? What is the best? Am I willing to put my talents in service to others? If, you, if you're willing to ask those questions and act on that, then suddenly the arrows start pointing outward. The one topic that we have not talked about yet, though, is the why. Why would you do this? 
Because if you stop and consider it, you're not hearing too many people tell you what we've been talking about over the last three weeks. Society is not really telling you that. Society is telling you that, well, it's, it's, it is. It's all about you. Some of you would know those expressions, you know, look out for number one. That's the big thing. Or perhaps some of you know that expression, you know, the person that dies with the most toys wins. Those are attitudes from our society that, no, the arrows, they should point into you. That's good. You want that. And we hear that message so much that you might ask yourself, well, is this stewardship thing, is this even a good idea? You might answer the question of why just by saying, well, I'm a disciple of Jesus. Jesus tells me to be a steward, therefore I'll be a steward. That's a terrific reason, of course. But for a lot of people, I suspect it's not enough. You need a little bit more. You need a little bit of the, like, tell me this makes sense. And it does. James, the second reading, I'll let you dig in it, but if you look at that very closely, James is offering a warning to people who have the arrows pointed in to themselves. He's not pulling any punches either. He's telling them that, yeah, at the moment, you're, you're doing okay. You, you, got, you, got, you got crops, you got clothes, you got gold, silver. You're doing fine now, but it's not going to last. And he's warning them that if they continue on this path where it's all about them, mm, you, there's going to be all this wailing of teeth. You, oh, don't, don't go there. And maybe that helps. I was helped uh, just a few years ago by reading a book called The Second Mountain. It was written by a guy named David Brooks. He's a writer. And, uh, um, and Brooks suggested that for many of us, a lot of Americans... We, there's a trajectory that's common to us all in our lives. Suggested that, you know, after like high school, college, we start on this path, we climb a particular, this mountain, the mountain our society tells us to climb, the mountain, if you will, of success, the mountain where the, uh, the arrows are all pointed in. And, and so you work your way up, you know, you, you, you get better jobs, more money, you, you, you do whatever you're expected to do, so you get married and have the 2.3 kids, whatever it is, you do all this stuff. But he said that for everybody, something happens. In his case, it was a divorce after 20-some years of marriage. That was what knocked him off that mountain. He had been doing really well. He had reached really quite a high point in his profession, but the divorce made all that useless, and he fell off the mountain. He suggested that for some people it's personal tragedy, death of a loved one, an illness for you, someone you know, and for some it's just a realization. They get to the top of this mountain. They get to the success they've been after. You know, they get to that stage in life and they realize, I now have everything I've been striving for and it's not enough. They realize that there's this big hole in their life. It doesn't work. And then you fall off the mountain and Brooks suggests that you spend the time in the valley trying to, like, orient yourself. I don't understand. I did everything I was supposed to do and what, what happened? And then he says, hopefully you start climbing the second mountain. The mountain you soon realize, the mountain you should have been climbing from the very beginning. This is the mountain where the arrows are pointed out. And a, a mountain, if you will, of service to others. Jesus put it very clearly. He said, the, the person that tries to save their life will lose it. You, you save your life. You're on that first mountain. It's all about me. The arrows are in. And, he, and Jesus says, you know, you're, you're going to lose it. It's not going to work. But those that lose their life for his sake in the Gospels will save it. They'll find it. 
And it doesn't really make any sense. You keep saying, we're like, well, 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 wait, 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 wait. If I give all my, my stuff, you know, like if I give my life away, if you will, if I put my life in service to others, I don't see how I get anything out of that. But you don't have to be too long on this second mountain to realize, oh my word, is Jesus right about this? And you will quickly, perhaps likely, regret spending any time on this other mountain. I know that from my own life. I spent a little time, fortunately, not too much. I spent a little bit of time on this first mountain. It was all about me. And it didn't work. It didn't work well at all. Fortunately, the good Lord got me off of it quickly and without a lot of pain and anguish. But now that I've been over on this second mountain for all these years, I can tell you there is nothing, nothing over here that I long for, that I want. Because it's just empty. So as we conclude our time of talking about stewardship, you recall that when we started, the whole point was just to think about it, to let the good Lord speak to us, to ask those questions so that we might check in. And so that's all we want to do. We've learned a little bit more. Maybe again this week. Maybe it's worth taking this to prayer. Maybe thinking of this image of the mountain. What mountain are you on? And if you're still on that first mountain, I encourage you to give it a lot of thought. Is this actually working for you? Because you may be going to bed at night, you know, in those quiet moments when your, your soul is, is really available to you and you realize, ah, it's empty. I am climbing to nothing. And if that's the case, the good Lord always offers us a chance to repent and just go onto this other mountain to be a steward, to serve, to ask, look for better uses of our time, our talent, our treasure.